I will do my best to keep this short. We're already running a little late. I think that's what happens when you get three preachers up here a lot instead of just having one or two here. Um, so I'll get right into it. Lord, help us. Lord, help me. I think this is an interesting sermon that he's given me to speak on. Uh, I've had it for a few weeks now, <clears throat> ruminating on it. I love thinking over the things of God. Whenever God gives me something to talk about, I try to find um, ways that it connects with the ways that uh, he has already spoken to us about. We do that as a, as a body. Most of the time we actually go on long um, preaching Sundays after Sundays on the same type of thing with different perspectives. Um, and uh, I think we do a good job, or we try to do a good job, connecting in the different points that God has given us. But this one, God is talking to me about doors. I'm going to speak on doors. Kind of interesting, huh? Well, I have a little, little boy. My little boy in our house is getting to the place where he is crawling and almost walking. And that is the time when most parents know that doors are about to be opened. Especially under the sink. I don't know how they're drawn to that. It's where all the cleaning supplies are. It's where a lot of other things are that are um, maybe dangerous for him. They're not bad things. We need those things. We use them. But they are not for him. So now we start locking doors. He wants to get in all of it. The other door he really wants to get into is the bathroom door. Don't know why. That's just where he will go. If the bathroom door is open, he is in there. Why? I can't understand why that's so important to him. But it is, and it's a place that we think he shouldn't be in very much, especially alone. It'll make a mess. And it's pretty unsanitary for him. Do you know who else had a thing for doors? The Apostle Paul. He talked about it all the time, in fact. It was one of the ways that he described his ministry. Not only physically. I'll get to this in a little bit. Because doors literally were opened to him. Prison doors were literally opened to Paul. Chains fell off of him and doors were opened. There's one story where everything opened and the, the jailer came and saw it and said everyone's left after he was specifically told, don't let these guys go. But everyone didn't leave. They were all still there and they saw him about to kill himself and they said, wait, these doors were opened, yes, but we stayed here. Why did they do that? They were unjustly put there. Paul understood this idea, and he talked about open doors in Colossians 4. This is what he's asking for people. He's saying, at the same time, pray for us also, as he's writing to the Colossian church, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Prayers went up. In 1 Corinthians 16, Paul tells them about his uh, plans of staying in Ephesus at the time. He's talking about wanting to come and visit them, but not just to stop by and say hi and go to somewhere else, that he wants to be with them. And so he's saying, instead of going to them or stopping by, he's saying, a wide door for effective work has been opened to me. And there are many adversaries. Let's remember that. And in 2 Corinthians 2, he's talking to them again. He says, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest. He's talking about a time, we're actually going to get to it in Acts, um, when, yeah, God opened a door. Great things were happening, but it wasn't necessarily easy for him. So in my old house that I grew up in, I'm sure I've heard this from other of my siblings. I still dream that I'm in that house when I dream. There was something special about that house to me. This house had so many doors. And they didn't quite make sense to me as a kid 
I thought they most of them were magical. It might have been because of my understanding of Narnia uh, and love of that. But they didn't seem to lead anywhere, so I thought that doors that didn't connect to each other physically actually would have connected if I walked through it. For some reason, that's what my mind thought. There's this door that was in a, in a landing, in a foyer, and a big wooden steps would come down, and my dad had a, 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 a tree there for, for a coat tree, and it was blocking it. But there was a door right there. Now, I didn't, and I still don't always think this way. I believed more things, so I didn't in my mind actually know that that actually just went to the kitchen, and it was probably for servants to go in and out instead of going to the living areas, but there was a, a magic door there for me, and the only other door that I knew that didn't lead anywhere was a door outside into the same kitchen, but on the other side of the room, and in my mind, I would go through that one door, and I would come out the other one. I just That was a fact to me. Now, I couldn't do it because it was locked, so I was always trying to find ways to do that to experience this wondrous thing, which would be to go through the kitchen without going through the kitchen. I would enter one door and exit the other door on another porch. Never got to it. Couldn't unlock it. If I would have opened it, it would have just gone to the back of some cupboards on both sides, really. But in my mind, I thought that. But doors in the Bible... Well, let me talk about something here. This is when you study scripture and you study uh, hermeneutics. Um, There's something called the law of first mention. I'm going to go into that. But I'm going to give a quote about the law of first mention by uh, a Southern Baptist preacher named David Jeremiah. He's well known and respected, at least for his theological understandings. And it says, those who study the Bible in a serious way sometimes refer to the law of first mention. It's not so much a law, really as a common principle in scriptures. If you select an important biblical word, say, worship, you'll find that its first biblical appearance sets the tone for all the riches of meaning that will emerge. Through the word, we go on to find many new understandings and many variations on the theme, but the first cut is the deepest. The first mention gives us the essential picture. It's something that people who study theologically understand this principle. Well, the first mention of a door is in Genesis 4-7. We don't know how they lived back then. It doesn't say in Scripture that they had houses. We don't know. In Garden of Eden or after they were expelled from that, we don't technically know how they lived, but they never described doors yet. The first time they describe a door is Genesis 4-7. And this is where God is talking to Cain. Cain hadn't done anything bad yet. He had only given a sacrifice that God didn't notice. I have a long teaching on this, and I love that teaching, but I can't get into it now since it's probably almost noon. So, Paul, I mean, sorry, Cain is downcast. And God comes to him and starts talking to him about this. Hey, why are you so upset? Just because I favored his doesn't mean you're a bad person now. That's not what we're talking about here. And, and God talks to him about a, 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 uh, the way to live. Now, in, in Hebrew culture and in their words, they don't only have doing verbs. They have being verbs. Sometimes they're connected in a different way than in, in English. Um, but the word yatab is actually more of a being verb than any of a doing verb. So normally translated, if you do what is right, this is Genesis 4-7, will you not be accepted? But if you not, do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. The very first mention of door is not a physical place. The very first mention of door is an idea, a spiritual reality that there is a door to us. That there is a door spiritually. Every other mention of door, whether it be a physical door, a tent door, the gates of your city, all of those are supposed to describe what this first mention is, which is a spiritual door that's out there. There is a door to us. And what God is essentially trying to give to Cain here is, hey, if you go outside of the way I created you, if you don't become who I've created you to become, 
Now there's this struggle that you're going to have at the door of you, Cain. There's a struggle. I didn't create you to have a struggle, but there will be if you start living in another way that I created you to live. At your door, sin is crouching. Now to go off on a little tangent here, if you do what is wrong, that's a sin. So how can God say if you do what is wrong, sin is crouching at your door? So God's more talking about the essence of who we are and who we choose to be and how we relate to him. That's what God is talking about here if you look more into it. Sin is crouching at your door. And the word crouching there is what they use for beasts that are lying in wait to surprise prey. It's not crouching because it has a back issue. Sin isn't crouching there to, uh, you know, to lay down only, because this word is actually used to lay down. But the idea behind this is it is ready to pounce. That's its territory. Outside of your door is the territory of sin if you start living outside the way God wants. And what he tells them is, if you start living outside that way, every time at your door, you're going to have to struggle with things. And I don't want you to do that. Pretty powerful picture. It's a spiritual door. Doors are not just entryways in Scripture. In the Hebrew culture, and even beyond that, when you get into the Greek culture, there are places of authority. There are places of judgment. There are places of communication. Do you know that as... People would actually sit. If you go to Middle Eastern countries now, you can actually see this. Northern African countries, people sit at their door, and as you walk by, they communicate. Or they communicate to each other back and forth. They can talk to people as they walk by. It's a normal thing. This is where you converse at your doorstep. That's your property. It's your place. It's your authority. And you can talk however you want to talk at that point. That's kind of the way that the culture works. It's also a place of safety. This is mine. In many places, they talk about defending that. Another interesting point here is if slaves wanted to permanently become a part of your family, what they would do is that they would go to their door and they would pierce the slave's ear with an awl and pierce it into the door. And that was a mark of saying, you're now part of my family. You're not just someone that works for me. Even by law, you're not just a slave. You are a permanent member of my household. Back then, slaves weren't seen necessarily always, especially in the Hebrew culture, as someone that you hurt and beat and you owned. In fact, many people wanted to be owned by their owners because there was safety in there. You actually became part of the family. There was even parts of inheritance for the slaves that wanted to be permanent members. And that's where you did it. You did it at the door. Because the door is an important place in Scripture. And God wanted to make that correlation. But remember, the first mention says that the door is a spiritual place. So all these other physical things that you can read about doors are actually supposed to describe that and enlighten that. Door in Hebrew is... Pataka. It's mentioned 164 times in the Old Testament. Many of the scriptures that we know, um, that is what this word is. It's in Psalm 24, which is lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up eternal doors. It's talking about doors there. Not necessarily your door. But other doors, the doors like what Paul was talking about. Paul wasn't asking that you open his door, pray that his door would be open for the preaching of the gospel. He was talking about other doors that are open, other people's doors, individuals, or beyond that. There are more doors. Door in the New Testament in Greek is thura, T-H-U-R-A, thura, mentioned 39 times. All right, I'm going to quickly try to go through this. There are three lessons about doors I want to go through. I won't talk any more about the other things I had. Lesson number one is Genesis 4 versus Genesis 18. This is a fun one. Genesis 4 talks about 
the door that God was trying to tell him that sin is crouching at if you're not living the way he's asked you to live. But look at Genesis 18. It says, The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Doors were not, you know, that was like the living room in sometimes. You didn't go inside the tent all the time. He was sitting at his door, like the rest of the culture still do now many times, and God appeared to him. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance to his gate to meet them. Now here is what I want to give us. The first lesson. The reason why God doesn't want us to live and deal with sin the same way that we have been, why Jesus died, is because there's two ways that we can live our life. One is in sin where we have to struggle with that, and the other one is when we're at our door, sin's not struggling with us, we can see God. We can run to meet him. I'm not saying God won't meet us us if we're dealing with sin. I'm saying we have to struggle with it. That's what God said in Genesis 4. It's crouching. It's waiting at your door. You have to struggle and master it. But if you live according to his word, if you're able to work on these things at your door when God appears, you can just go to him. The struggle isn't there. It's a perfect picture of New Testament Christianity where you can be free. You can be forgiven. It's not easy work. But at your door of your heart, when God appears and you see him, you can run to him without this struggle. And guess what? There's forgiveness. There's grace. But we have to ask. We have to get that over with. And we have to work on not doing it anymore. Because that is another step that we have to take every time when God appears. It's harder for us. It takes longer, maybe, for us to see him. I love that picture. That's lesson one. I have way more to say about it. But lesson two, the doing doors, I call it. The to-do doors, the things that Paul was talking about. This is in Acts 16. I don't know if I actually put that in here. Let's see if I marked it. Yay, I did. Listen to this. What a great picture for us. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. It doesn't say it there, but literally it said the Holy Spirit closed the door. He prevented them to going to Asia. He closed the door. This isn't only about open doors. This is about closed doors. The doors out there in our view. Literally in in Acts here, it says that the Holy Spirit closed the door so they couldn't go preach in Asia because God had another plan. Acts 16, this starts in verse 6. I already read part of it. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia. Listen to what it says here. But the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. He shut another door. A great lesson for us. Doors being shut does not mean you are bad. It does not mean you are wrong. In fact, it means if we can hear him, we can move on. We don't have to wait and dither at doors that are shut, at least in that way, about going out and doing things. So, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him to come to Macedonia and help them. And then it says, when Paul woke up, They talked and they said, yep, that's probably God telling us to go there. So they went there and it says it was a major open door for them. Well, do you know what happened? They were stripped naked and beat and put into jail. That's the open door they went to. God did great things, however. It has great testimonies coming out of that. This is the one with the jailer where they were released. Open doors does not mean easy. That is part of lesson two. So here is the crux of things. When we find an open door, 
Are we willing to go into it not knowing the outcome? I know that that's scary, but his will and his grace and his power is sufficient. If we read what Paul says throughout his books and his epistles, he is okay with this. I know we love and respect him. I, one of the stories I love about my grandma and grandpa on my mom's side is whenever you talk about Paul, they'd go, oh, that Paul. They loved him. I do too. But we can also do. He's not greater than every other single one of us, except for he obeyed, listened, and went after him with all of his heart. He might have been called to higher things or more things than us, but you are still able to hear God just as well as him. You can walk through open doors. I don't think God's going to give us torture right away. He may never. I'm not looking for that or even saying that's going to happen. What I'm saying is it may not be easy. Ease is not a deterrent or is not the only way that we do things. God does not promise ease. He promises that his will will be done. See, Jesus himself said in John 5, I only do what I see the Father doing. Jesus, if anyone could do whatever they wanted to do, it was, should be him. There's one point in Scripture that blows my mind where he talks to people and says, I have much to say to you in judgment, but the one who sent me is faithful. He was saying, in my own opinion, I want to judge you guys right now. But I'm not going to because Father said not to. He has other plans. And in fact, if you really want to get deep into this, at the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus could have said to him, instead of pass this cup for me, he could have said, if it's your will, let this door be locked. May I not have to walk through this door. Jesus understood doors. In fact, he said that he is the true door in John 10. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. The doors in Scripture abound. But as I'm going longer, I, and I know I say that a lot, I'm going to finish. Lesson three, the doors of Philadelphia versus Laodicea. This is the end of Scripture in Revelation. God is talking to two churches, and he says two things about doors. Pretty wild what he says here. In Revelation 3.8, he's talking to Philadelphia, and it says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I'm telling you, you don't have to be powerful in the Lord. He knows that we have little anyways, but he's talking to a group of, of, of churches, or the, the church singular, in the city, which there were many different meeting places of. And he says, I know your works. And he's basically saying, your works weren't great. You don't have a lot of power. He's not trying to say, man, you guys have done the greatest things in the history of churches. He's just saying, you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Therefore, I will open a door for you that no one will be able to shut. What an amazing understanding that he's giving us here. And I want to give us, we, we, we talk down to Laodicea a lot. We judge them maybe a little bit. Maybe we're hoping we're not them. Here's what I want to say. God said some powerful, good things to this group. In fact, I bet Laodicea actually maybe have did, had done more things than Philadelphia had. They had a bigger responsibility in many ways. And God is trying to tell them there's more. You guys are not perfect right now. The people who were humble, God said, I'm going to open a door. The people who got haughty, God said to them, you're, you're, you're lukewarm. I'm going to spit you out. You could have done good things. I, I'm, I'm not saying you didn't do good things, but it's not only about that. He says to them in verse 15 of Revelation 3, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. But in verse 20, look what he says. He goes through talking to them, and he corrects them. And in fact, in that, he says, I correct the people I love. He desperately loves them. But listen to what he says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Right after that, it talks about conquerors and doing wonderful things. See, what I think happens sometimes is when wonderful things happen with humans, most, we, we stop saying God helped me or saying we need him. And we close him out and we think I can do it. I, I, I know many examples of this in our current day. And these churches were not bad churches necessarily. I'm not trying to say, trying to judge them in any way. But when it becomes man-centered, Christ says, hey, it's about me. You can do big and powerful things, but if I'm not the point, if I'm not the emphasis, it's going to crumble. So here I am knocking at the door of your church, at the door of your community, at the door of your city. Let me in. Let it be about me. So these are not just doors, individual doors for people. There is that. I gave you lesson one was about your door. Struggling with sin or not having to and being able to see God quicker. Lesson two, I had doors about going out, about things that you can do. And then it might not be easy. And lesson three, I had doors about cities, churches, groups. I asked the Lord while I was doing this yesterday, I said, Lord, what's the final piece to this for me? It was funny. I walk out in my living room, and my daughters are watching Monsters, Inc. If you've never seen it, that's okay. What happens is that these door, these, there's a huge number of doors and a door just comes and drops right down at their workstation and when they open it up they can go and it transports them anywhere in the world that they're supposed to go i won't get into the detail but it was such a great picture for me doors are dropped down to where they are and it transports them anywhere to where that that door is supposed to lead missions i can see this in missions you know when we go on mission trips I haven't gone on one in a little while, but I believe I've been there because there's the door of prayer and intercession that, that leads the way. That door is powerful and needed for those of us that stay behind. Doors are everywhere. Don't be afraid. Just like my son, my youngest boy, Everywhere is now a brand new opening. Oh my gosh, there are so many doors. Oh, Tupperware is in here. Whoa, that's pots and pans. They're everywhere now to him. Doors are everywhere. And to you, I want to say doors are everywhere. Don't be confused. Just because you see a door doesn't mean you're supposed to walk into it. The point of this is to hear him, is to be after it. Let him tell you. If your eyes are opened and you see them, walk according to his will. Hear what he is doing. As Jesus says, I'm only going to do what I see my father doing. We have that same relationship with Jesus and what he's doing on this earth. I hope that was clear enough, and though it was possibly a little rushed, um, maybe at the end here I'll have Dad say what he, what he said at the uh, the beginning, because it was powerful to me to hear what he was saying, how it went together with this word. So, Dad, would you mind coming up and saying that? And then we'll end after, um, after this. Thank you. Lord be with you. At the end of what I said um, when I was... Um, Opening with Psalm 37, I said, When you recognize that you are caught up in worry or fretting or fear, make an intentional turn into worship, thanksgiving, exaltation of the Almighty God you serve. This opens a door for Him to move in your behalf.